I am critiquing Andy Stanley today. Uh, several clips of his have made their rounds recently, and uh, this has lately been happening about once a year. We see some Andy Stanley clips surfacing. It it kind of breaks my heart a little bit because, um, you know, about 20 years ago, I actually used one of his books for my youth curriculum. It was a book targeting youth ministry. It was great, great stuff. Uh, good advice for young people. I used it for, for an entire year. I mean, so I, just to see where he has gone in his leadership and his rhetoric, um, the he, he's really affirming a lot of, you'll see what I'm talking about here in a, in a couple of moments, but he's affirming a lot of these fringe societal groups. Uh, but but the problem is, as, as church people, when we do this, we, and, and I think you all know what group I'm talking about, what we end up doing is alienating the church itself, you know, the, the people that are tithing, the people that are actually trying, doing their best to raise their kids in what's increasingly becoming a pagan culture. And, uh, you know, so it, it a lot of these kinds of things... I did a video on him a while back. They kind of come across to your average churchgoer like a kick in the teeth. You know what I mean? Like, look, I'm just out here trying to raise my kids. I'm trying to go to church. And, that, and that's hard to do in and of itself. Now, when I go to church, you're telling me I'm, you know, bigoted and I'm uh, a jerk. And, and why would anybody want to come to my church? The, the people that don't come to the church, they're the real heroes. You know, that, that kind of stuff. Um, it's just, just real terrible stuff, in my opinion for a pastor to say. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, he, he made, uh, uh, it's been a while now, but he's, he made some controversial statements about unhinging the Old Testament from the New Testament, which really doesn't make a lot of sense because theologically speaking, the Old Testament is the foundation of the New Testament. And I, I'm of the mindset that really the New Testament is more of a continuation of the Old Testament rather than anything. Like, without the Old Testament, what does... Jesus really mean? Like, like, did the things that he taught us really have any meaning at all? <laughs> they don't. And so uh, that Old Testament is so vital. It's so important. All those Old Testament prophets foreshadowed Jesus. That Old Testament law foreshadowed Jesus. Jesus didn't cancel the Old Testament law. He just fulfilled some of the ceremonial elements of it. But all the moral elements of the Old Testament law really are still in effect. The Ten Commandments are certainly still in effect. And uh, any culture that would seek to do good, any nation that would seek to do good, would certainly make a priority um, of integrating God's law, his holy law from his holy word into its, uh, into its national laws. But having said all that, there have been some, uh, you know, right, I guess, video clips surfacing from his most recent sermon. And um, I, I'm going to just throw this word out there because, gosh, I hate using it, but he's pushed me too far. It's the H word. No, I'm not talking about that one. I'm talking about heretic. Like, is Andy Stanley, has he just crossed the line into the heretical? Back in the day, there was a, uh, this is early on in Christian history. There was a, a dude, his name was Marcion, and he, he actually like carved up what we now call the Bible, and he basically said, yeah, I'm just going to use part of the Gospel of Luke. Um, we're going to completely eliminate the Old Testament. He, he basically was trying to cr do what Andy's doing today and create a, a Gentile, uh, Gentile, Gentile-sized <laughs> version of Christianity apart from uh, its Jewish roots. And uh, actually, it, it, it really became sort of an anti-Semitic thing back then. This is, you know, some 2,000 years ago. I, I mean, what Andy's teaching today isn't really much different from that. But, hey, let's dive into his most recent sermon, and you can see for yourself. So today, um, we're starting a brand new series next week. I'm so excited about that, but this is just a week in between. So I get to talk about whatever I want to talk about, which is generally what I talk about anyway. Um, so is that supposed to be funny? Like, does he start off all of his sermons? He, does he really honestly preach every sermon? Uh, does he just talk about what he wants to talk about? I mean, I, that's not a really great way for a pastor to give an intro, Today, I think. This is, this is a message... For really for anybody who's listening, whether it's first time or not. But today I just want to talk about two things real quick. Number one, something that breaks my heart. And then number two, Ooh. something that makes me grateful. Spoiler alert, um, you 
are what make me grateful, and that'll become clear Aww, in just a minute. That's, that's um, so this nice. Is your first time with us, I'm not grateful your for you or your church, teaching. Or your first time back in church. I'm praying for you, time. but I maybe you don't consider not yourself grateful a church for person, not a Christian person. Maybe from a different faith tradition. Maybe you're still trying to figure it out. Maybe you just have more questions than anybody's been able to answer. But like, does, is this guy preaching to the church at all? Like <laughs> he just mentioned like so many groups there. It's like, it's like, it's church on Sunday morning. Like isn't the church is, uh, it's the called out ones. The church is the people that you're speaking to who are believers in Jesus. That's who the church is. Like <laughs> I'm all for, uh, reaching out. I mean, the church is supposed to evangelize, but I mean, I'm just wondering, like, who's he talking to here? I, I would think he's like speaking at an atheist convention. I am so glad you are here or are listening or watching this oh. message because mm. here's what we decided years ago as a, as a group of local churches. We know there are things that make the church um, resistible that the church itself should be Resisting. In fact, much of what you resist, oh. perhaps, about the local church are things that the church should have been resisting all along. And today, I'm going to talk about a couple of those things. Now, you know what's interesting is I saw some of this already, and it, it, what's interesting about his statement here is is he says that the church should should be resisting some things, except for these other things over here. If you're if you're resisting some of these things over here, then you're uh, you're a jerk and you're bigoted. But if if these are the things that the church says. It's almost like he's kind of like, kind of like doing a little bit of double speak. You'll see he goes into an explanation of like the Pharisees and how bad the Pharisees were, and and certainly uh, there was a lot of Pharisaic what Pharisaical Judaism had become that was terrible. There were some Pharisees that followed Jesus, but his dialogue is a little nonsensical here because, uh, as you'll see, he goes on to basically say that uh, you know we're we're modern day Pharisees because we are pushing back against some. Uh, of the cultural evils that we see in our day. But but what's he doing by definition in his sermon? He's pushing against what he perceives to be a cultural evil, albeit a wrong Set one. Set it up. I want to go back to where this all began. And by this, I don't mean our local church. I mean the church. Um, this is Jesus. I want us to look for just a minute at Jesus' final vision cast for ecclesia. That was a Greek word to describe his gathering, his assembly. It became the word church in our English New Testaments. We've talked about it's that. It's the people, ecclesia. Andy. Matthew was the there ecclesia for this. is the Matthew people. Was a former tax collector. He was wealthy. He had scribes. So he gets, he gets all this detail because he was a very literate person. And here's what he tells us. How is this how Jesus would have described his great commission vision casting? Was Jesus, <laughs> was he vision casting? Is that, is that, uh, I, wonder, I wonder if that's how he would have said it or the apostles, you know, like before they were killed, like martyred. Like, I wonder if, I wonder if they, they would have said, uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus he was the great vision caster. Jesus has been crucified. He rose from the dead. He's been around for about a month and a half. And now he's giving his farewell address to his mm. core group of followers. And here's, here's wow. what happens. You, if you grew up in church, you've heard all of this before. Uh, Matthew says that then the 11 disciples, there's only 11 because who's missing? Yeah, the front row knew that. Judas, kidding. Everybody knew that. Judas, so we're down to 11. Um, is, is it just me or do his jokes like completely fall flat because I, I can't handle his preaching style and his personality. Like he, he comes across like he's trying to ram something down my throat as a preacher. So it's kind of like, I guess the people in his church might laugh at some of this stuff. It's just, it's a little hard for me to swallow personally. Disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. And the reason he told them to go to Galilee, which was way north of Jerusalem, is because it was safer there because these were men who were being hunted because they were followers of the crucified wannabe fake Messiah, and now there's this rumor that the Messiah has risen from the dead and there's chaos everywhere in Judea and Galilee, safe distance. And when they saw him, Matthew says, when all of us got there, when we, when we saw him, he writes, they asked him all those questions. They've been dying to ask him. So that's not in the Bible. I just see who's paying attention. Yeah, this is, this is what okay. we think we're going to do. As a pastor, I've heard this my whole life, you know, my whole career. It's like, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God. I'm like, I don't think you are, but, you know, just Why don't we stick see. with the Bible, When Andy. I get to heaven, I've got all these questions. Well, I don't know how it works exactly, but when you find yourself in the presence of God, I think you're going to do exactly what this crew did. When they saw him, Matthew says, I was there. This crew. We worshiped him. Like, who is he speaking to? Is he talking to teenagers? This, this crew. <laughs> That's what, 
This crew, that's what this, this crew, all those guys that died for Jesus, the apostles, the disciples of the Lord. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to do it. I, this crew, I, like, what, who's he talking to? They, they worshiped a man. This is something a Jewish person. And I, I, gosh, I'm so sorry. I keep stopping this. Does anybody else think anything about his mannerisms? Like at all? And I don't know, it's it's not necessarily just an effeminate thing. Like, it it seems like, this is, a, this is a problem that I have with a lot of modern preachers. They use effeminate mannerisms, and, and it seems like they are, they think they're winning people over by doing that, you know? And, and, and what I mean is, like, their body language, is, it's, it's kind of just like, well, I'm just trying to share this little truth with you. Like, uh, does anybody else notice that about modern, but they don't all do this. Like, there's some actual, like, men out there that are, that are preaching. But like so many of them think this is like a, I guess a good strategy. You know, I, I'm, I'm not at all telling you, hey, go out there and, and be a jerk when you're preaching. I, I'm just, I'm just saying like, my goodness, like what, what are we doing? You would never do. You, you don't worship idols. You don't worship images. You're not going to worship a man. And yet these Jewish boys, they worship this man because they saw him die. They looked into an empty tomb. They considered him a god. And I love Matthew's honesty, but there were some who were just like, this is so hard to, 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 to fathom. And then Jesus begins his farewell address um, with what I, my opinion, I think this is the most important and the most overlooked statement in the entire New Testament. Maybe Ooh, let, in the let's whole hear Bible, what is it? But for sure, what is this it? is the most important hmm. and the most un- overlooked, underplayed, doesn't get any airtime statement in the whole New Testament. And what should get your attention is, for those of you who are raised in church, you don't know what the next statement is. Hmm. And I think it's, the, it, it's preeminent. This is crazy talk, unless it's true. And if it's hmm. true... The church should organize around this statement. And if the church had organized around this statement, We're waiting. the church would look better, <laughs> We're feel better. It's and so important. More, more important. I'm not going to tell you what it is. More all-inclusive than it currently is. Here's what he said. No. All authority. Little Greek word, pos. It's not like a fancy word. It just means every, all. All authority in heaven and on earth. Mm. Heaven and on earth. That's pretty much everything, right? Heaven to earth. All authority in heaven and earth yeah, has been given so. by my Father to me. Oh. Wow. Wow. Oh. Wow. Wow. This is part of the Great Commission? Holy moly. I feel, I honestly feel like I'm having a conversation with a two year old at this point. It's like, it's like, this is the statement that Jesus made. I mean, this is the sentence that, that it, the, the first sentence of the Great Commission, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. <laughs> Therefore, go disciple the nations. That's the, that's the Great Commission in Matthew 28. So it's like, like that's that I, every church, every pastor that I know uh, in the world is aware of this. I, I'm, I'm still What's the revelation here? This statement here? has been reduced to simply another statement or another verse in the Bible. Yeah. Equated with every mm-hmm. other statement or verse in the Bible, and that is tragic. Because okay. Jesus said this 300 plus years before the first Bible was ever assembled. And when I say assembled, the Bible was assembled. They took the Hebrew text and a, ver- a version of the Hebrew text. They took the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. They took the letters of Paul and others, and they put them all together in one book, and somebody named it the Bible. We don't know when, or we don't know how, who did who did it, the, which means the books is all it meant. It's like, let's just... What? This is like the worst explanation of how the Bible came together that I've ever seen a Christian give. I mean, I've seen atheists talk like this. I, we don't know who, what, what happened. It just, the Bible, it just came together. Whoa, whoa. Ah, oh, my goodness. We don't know how, when, or who, or what, or where. Who, who, dude, spin or turn around. I, like, the Bible was put together by God in history, and it was an act of God. It's the infallible, perfect word of God. No, Andy, it's, it's not just the book, it's the book. It's the book that God wrote. It's a very important one. I want to look into that. The book's not very creative, but it's stuck. The Biblia, the, the Bible, 
do you all have a lot of experience with mega pat mega church pastors talking like this i, I mean it's like I, I feel like we've like oversimplified things to the point that we're we feel like we're trying to talk to like a toddler you know what i mean like like well uh, my savior your savior well, for for a christian you're, like a, a person who's visiting your church I think they're aware that they are in a Christian church. Like, you don't have to, like, you know, play so much to the audience. I mean, I, I would think people actually want to hear a little bit about what your belief system is. That's why they're there. Like, why hold back? Why? What's with all the, like, you know, dodging and, 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 and hedging? And, and, and my goodness, just speak, speak, man. Not the Bible. Just speak. The, the Bible infers, if you just take speak the, Bible, to the Bible had a voice, the, Vi the Bible proclaims that Jesus, your Savior and King, is your ultimately author ultimate authority. More importantly, Jesus said that Jesus is our ultimate authority. And in ignoring the implications of this statement is how church leaders have gotten by with so much harmful nonsense century mm. after century after century because somebody like me, because I'm so well acquainted and well versed in the verses of the old. Okay, just hold on a second here. See, see, this is what just bothers me. This is what I meant about the whole kick in the teeth thing. It's like, are you a pastor? Are do you actually like the church? I mean, this whole thing here is talking about how bad the church has been, and this is like the Western narrative today. It's 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 why. Eventually, Christianity will be persecuted again if, like, the church doesn't actually start to push back against these ridiculous tropes and narrative that the world is trying to level on us. Like, the church has done more good historically than any other organization or group of people ever in human history. Just Fact check me. Look into it. You'll see. Christians founded America. Christians pushed for people to have freedoms. Christians are still pushing today for human rights across the world. Christians built the first hospitals. Christians used to rescue babies that were left to exposure out, you know, in the days of the Roman world and stuff like that. Created the first organizations. Christians, 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 Christians did it. Christians were the ones who created Western civilization. Apparently, he knows better than everybody else that's come before him. I mean, why are we spending so much time apologizing for all of the wonderful things that the church has done for this culture? And, like, who hasn't had a bad church experience? If you've had a bad church experience, welcome to the club. It's because the church is people. Like, I've been a pastor for many years. Many, I, I could tell you countless war stories that are probably much worse than what you've experienced. It has not affected my relationship with Jesus at all. It has not affected my desire to go to church at all. I love church. Church energizes me. Church was the people that Jesus died for. Stop talking bad about the church, Andy. In the Testament, somebody like me can use and misuse. Bothers me. Apply and misapply the Bible in such a way. That I Guys, can sounds more like a slick salesman than he does an actual preacher of God's holy and Just perfect give me word. A minute. I'll find you a verse. I'll find you a story. I'll find you an implication. I will find you a loophole. But the life of Jesus, the message of Jesus, the way that Jesus interacted with people, there's virtually no wiggle room. I feel like this guy shouldn't be telling loopholes. anybody about this Jesus. This is why he was in a constant running battle with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and the scribes because they had so many loopholes and Jesus closes all of them and it drove them crazy. Oh. He says it's, it's, this, it's this simple. You are to love Like, is this people. what we've reduced the gospel to? Is just like Jesus is the great loophole closer? I mean, has he, like, <laughs> like, what? 
this is all. This is what we've done. Is we've just taken the gospel, the this this document. It's amazing that we even have it. Like if you study the history of the Bible and the, and the incredible persecutions that not just the Christians were under, but the Jews before them, and and if you just look at the history of God's word, it's, it's amazing that we even have it. People died like four or five hundred years ago just to translate it into English for you, so you could understand it. But but now it's like Jesus, it's like he's just sort of like our, you know, he meets the need of the day for us. And, and we just sort of boil Jesus down from conquering king, you know, in his global conquest. We've, we've watered him down, we've boiled him down to just, uh, he's the great loophole closer. I mean, that, isn't, isn't everyone looking for that, a great loophole closer? If it's, if it's good for him, it's good. If it's not good for him, it's a sin. If it's not good for them, it's a sin against them. If it's not good for her, you defer. Sheesh. If it's not good for you, no can do. Not because God is the sovereign lawgiver, but because God loves you. Good parents set rules to protect their children. Your is that why he closes the loopholes? Because he and loves he me? he brought Jesus, yeah. Jesus into the world to bring clarity. The apostle Paul said, you know, everything uh, before Jesus was a shadow. And you can tell a few things about, some, about a thing. So he brought Jesus into the world to bring clarity, but uh, people, everybody was confused about Jesus. Uh, uh, it, what is it? <laughs> It just Shadow. seems contradictory. And now this. the reality has come. And Jesus stands on the hill that day and says, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I'm your king. And oh. you know because you spent time with me that I have your best interest, best interest in mind, and I have come for the salvation, and I have come for the sake of the entire world. And then whoa, having claimed whoa. that kind of authority, he uses it. Here's what now he that's him. controversial. He says, this Holy is what I want mold. you to do with this authority. This is what he wants me to do with this authority. This is what he wants you to do with this authority. In fact, if you're not a Christian or you're sort of anti-Christian church, part of the problem is we haven't done what Jesus asked us to do. So, of course, there's resistance. Oh. We, we act sometimes like we're just another ideology or just another religion. Jesus is like, no, this is for the world. There, there, oh. There's nobody outside the invitation to this new kind of Boy, religion. If it's everything that he's saying, it is. If Jesus is who he's saying that Jesus is, why is he, like, being so sheepish about it? Do you know what I'm saying? Does anybody else, like, sense that? It's like, it's like, well, look, y'all, let me, let me tell you about Jesus today. And, uh, look, it, but if you don't want to believe that, it's okay. It's okay. If you don't believe that he is the, the king is the king, you will burn. Like, like let's be honest. Let's be honest. Let's be honest for a moment, friends. People deserve honesty. Let's not be sheepish. Let's not be jerks. But let's definitely not be sheepish in the way we share the gospel. Because here's, here's the thing. is When we do that, in my opinion, it comes across incredibly disingenuous, in my opinion. With God, your father, he says, now here's what I want you to do. That's how this guy comes across. And I want you to make Snake more oil followers salesman. of me. Peter, just like you're a follower of me, I want you to go multiply. John, just like you're a follower By the way, I think I might have been talking earlier when he was saying this, but apparently he's trying to draw some distinction that Jesus said, all authority has been given to me, not to the Bible. So he's, he's drawing this distinction? That J the authority is in Jesus, the authority isn't in the Bible. It's, it's a very nonsensical uh, statement, if you think about it. Because if the Bible is what it claims to be, the Word of God, like that's the, the, the word that it uses to, the uh, phrase that it uses to describe itself over and over and over again, going back to the Old Testament prophets, the scriptures, you know, then it was authored by Jesus and it carries the same authority. <laughs> so just, just a very, and, and what's the point? Why is he making this distinction? Does he think this is going to help non-believers? This is going to help them? Like from those evil Christians who are, we're just taking our Bible and we're just putting it up in the air and saying, you need to believe in this because it's the Bible. Here, I'm going to beat you down with it. You know, I mean, is it what, is, is this, this strategy is better? Jesus has more authority than the Bible. You don't even know who Jesus is apart from the Bible, genius. It's the only record we have of who he was. Right now, you're quoting the Bible as an authority of who Jesus was. 
How do you know that, that he said the Great Commission? If it's not the infallible word of God, if it doesn't carry any authority. I want you to go multiply. I want you to make more followers of me. Stupid. Well, it just, I, where do you there's no other word for it. I want you to just do it stupid. everywhere. And this is what bogged him down. He has to go make disciples of all people groups or all nations, our English text says, or all tribes Ethne or all in Gentiles the Greek. or all ethnicities, right? And are we supposed to do this by force, manipulation, or threats? No. <laughs> But here's Jesus with Because all those evil Christians out there are all saying we gotta do this by force. That, that's all every every evil Christian I know is saying we, we gotta do this by force. Like who is he preaching against? What Pharisee? It's like a mythological figure that a bunch of these like uh extremists, like true extremists in our culture, have they've just made this caricature of of the Christian. And those are the people apparently he's listening to. I, I Peter, guess. Remember how I did it? I said, Peter, I like Doesn't describe the Christians I know. Learn from me. Watch me. No, this is by example. This is by information. This is by influence. This is through humility. I want you to live your lives in such a way that people are curious. I want you to live your lives in such a way that people lean in. I want you to live your lives in such a way that people are like, I don't know if I can believe all that, but I'd like to try some of the, some of the stuff. I'd, I'd how like did Jesus carrying a whip ministry, into the temple, you know, how did that my, fit into what he's saying here? I my wife right. to just, you know, just think about our marriage a little bit differently. And you Christians seem to have figured that out. And then he oh. says this. And the, what, how did Jesus going into the temple with a whip and cords, how did that? I'm sure there were a lot of people in the audience. They were unbelievers, Andy, that day. He could have, he could have, oh, oh my goodness. He could have offended someone. Jesus could have offended somebody. <laughs> oh, God. In the temple. He could have offended Again, someone. This is right over us because of the way we experience baptism in church. And all of churches don't baptize the same way. But he says baptizing them. In the name of the Father and of the Son puts, his, puts himself in this equation. Amazing. And the Holy Spirit. And for them, they, they knew immediately what this was about. John the Baptist invented baptism the way that we do baptism. This was covenant language. Invented this it. Was, you I, are that's being not true at all. <laughs> the Jews were community. doing baptism for so long before John the Baptist. The same Maybe he just doesn't know history. I, I don't know. Together. This is and Charles Stanley's son, follower, friends. You are to baptize them like Charles Stanley. Immediately. Everybody's invited. No distinction. And then what comes next flows directly from his claim to have all authority. <laughs> Again, this may be the second most overlooked statement in the New Testament. Again, I, this anything this guy that tells me that's overlooked, I'm going right? to like literally changes almost su everything. suggest anything that it's that probably uh, the local church, been overemphasized. It's whatever he says, it's got to be the opposite. And when you go to make disciples, here's what I want you to tell these people. Like, look at his, just look at his manual. Like, he's like, he's like, when you go to make disciples, guys, like, I, he, please, preachers, don't be offended at what I'm saying. Like, in my humble opinion, guys like this, they look way worse than the people they're criticizing. They, they come across like a total powder puff. The apostles and the disciples in the New Testament, like, these people died for Christ. They were, they were viewed, they were, people were afraid of them. They were afraid, they were, there was great fear about the apostles. Do you remember the whole Ananias and Sapphira thing in the, in the Acts chapter, uh, what is that, four or five there? I, you remember that? They, they dropped dead, dead, because they lied to Peter. Them to obey everything. Please don't. I People, please stop preaching like this. This is just you. terrible. I, I, it's hard to watch. I want you to teach them. Matt everything. Chandler's a lot like this. I, Matthew, you wrote a lot of this down, didn't you? Yes, sir. John, you wrote a lot of it down, right? Mm -hmm. Some of you other guys took some notes. Most of his followers were illiterate. They had, they had to dictate this stuff to other people to get it out. I want oh, you oh, to tell oh, the world oh, oh, Is that how they got the Bible I to us? Oh. Have commanded. How do we know we can even trust it? What what? Should the Guys, get it out. Dictate teach. it. We're going to dictate this. The church should teach. The church should capitalize on what Jesus taught. Forgiveness regardless. If somebody makes you their enemy, don't return the favor. True. Right? Yeah. All right. Others first. 
that your wealth, your possessions. Stephen prayed wealth, for the possession. people that were They're killing him. Jesus prayed for the people who were killing him. All right. Further his influence and to do for other people and to show um, compassion and generosity to other people. He'd say, "Look, I want you to teach other people to be the Samaritan in the parable of the Good Samaritan." I really think his version of Jesus is like, and, and many are preaching this Jesus out there today. It's a false Jesus. It's a false God. It's the Jesus that we've made up, the Jesus that we've boiled down, the Jesus that we've stripped and neutered and, and emasculated. Um, like their version of Jesus never offends anyone, ever. Like, like how is that even possible? I mean, you, I don't think you can say anything to a, a, an audience, let alone a diverse one, and not offend. You can't say hello. Oh, well, I didn't like the way he said hello. I, look, friends, I've been a pastor for a lot of years. It's the truth. It's the way people are. You can't let it keep you from doing ministry, you know? Like, Jesus offended people. Like, he preached sermons that lots of people walked away from. I just, I, I don't, I don't get who, who and what he's preaching. Brother. Don't be like the older brother in the parable. It certainly doesn't seem biblical <laughs> to he use the word that he hates. This, here's what I promise. And surely, here's a promise that this promise isn't made to every Christian. This promise is made to the Christians who go and do what he's called us to do. He said, and surely I'm going to be with you always to the very end. Wait, this what? Is important. This isn't a. Of the age. This is not a promise that's made that to all Christians? To end, which is what? hard to believe, but nobody believed Jesus would rise from the dead either. And he did. And he said, this era, oh. this age is coming to an end. And I'm going to be with you in a special way. And who is you? You oh. are believers whose faith has feet. You're very special, Andy. You got that right. <laughs> and then the strangest thing happened. He left and they didn't. He said, go, and they did not go. They stayed. And I understand why they stayed. This is their home. These are their families. These are their friends. This is comfortable. This is Judean. This is Torah followers. This no, is God. Truth to the I, I can't handle the mannerisms of people. I can't. I can't. I can't. It's driving me crazy. It's driving me crazy. faith in Jesus. There was plenty to do in Galilee and plenty to do <sighs> In Judea, if I'm, if I ever visit your church, please, preacher, this, please, I love y'all. I thank you for what you're doing for the kingdom. Please don't do this kind of stuff. Please, I'm begging you, Jesus please. Because they were causing so much trouble at the temple and so much trouble in that area. Persecution broke out. And Luke, who documents the entire story of Jesus and what happened after the story of Jesus, tells us this, that when that persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, look at this. Everybody, all the Jesus followers, except the we just can't call them Christians, can we? I can't. Like, really? Really? The apostles, the people who knew him best and had been given this commission to take what they'd heard from him directly to the rest of the world. Everybody else was scattered throughout the I think he would Judea melt if the word Christian the came out of his in mouth in a positive sense. In a positive in some, sense. In some instances, traveled to Galilee. And consequently, the church, the church maintained a distinctly Torah-based Judean, oh, we would say whoa. Jewish flavor. Oh, okay. I don't know if y'all see what's going on here. See, what he's suggesting is that, you know, you look in the book of Acts, a great persecution broke out against the church. All the, the church was scattered, right? Except for the apostles. They were scattered to the different parts of uh, the Roman Empire, but the Judea specifically. So what he's suggesting is, man, these... These people were lazy. Now, look, there might be a sermon point to be had here, maybe, about how some of, yeah, we, we can tend to get comfortable as Christians and God's calling us out of our comfort zone. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. So we're looking at the persecution, the great persecution that took place uh, where the Jews persecuted the early Christians. And, and I don't know that we're allowed to say that today, but <laughs> historically that's what happened. Like, we're going to look at that and we're going to say that's because they were too comfortable. I mean, like, I think it's maybe a better way of saying it is God works through all things and he works all things to the good. I'm not going to look at a bunch of persecuted people and say they were being lazy. So God persecuted you like, especially because these people were already taking a risk to follow Jesus and to follow his followers. These early Christians, <laughs> Christians, and the movement, Christians, the Jesus movement stalled. 
Say it. Say it. Christians. They didn't go because they couldn't imagine it was this wide. They felt like it was more like this wide. And you know what they did? They simply added the teaching of Jesus to everything they were already teaching. They equated it with Torah, which, I, which is a big deal. Oh, like, I mean, Moses oh, is our please. guy. And you know what? We're going to... The Judea, he's talking about the Jews. I feel like I need to like qualify everything he says and, and really explain to you what he what, what he's really talking about. The the Judaizers that he's talking about, this is just such a, a just a, a a butchery of, of what's actually going on there. He's just saying, well, they just added Jesus to what they were doing. Like I don't it's just again so oversimplified. It was a very compl- a complex culture. All the early Christians were all Jews. All of them. And Andy, they were very good. Christians. They weren't bad Christians. They weren't evil. They just happened to be Jewish. And that part of our faith, by the way, because Jesus makes us Jewish in our heart through his Holy Spirit, he grafts us into Israel. He doesn't graft us into Germany or China or some other country. He grafts us into Israel, the people of God, through faith in Jesus They're not bad people. They're just doing their faith the way they know how to. That's all. That's all. I'm going to get in trouble for this, but we think Jesus is right up there with Moses. I mean, you could get arrested for that. Jesus is like, no, I didn't tie with Moses. I replaced Moses. I really think you can simplify things too much. And it it becomes nonsensical. But Moses put the ball on the tee, and I have come up, and I've done something for the entire world. And the law of Moses was so ingrained culturally, the apostles had a hard time not mixing and matching the covenants. God's covenant with Israel, which is so important. We call it the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. (laughs) (laughs) Well, what it is, two-year-olds, is it's the Old Testament is... That's God's covenant with Israel, and with the New Testament, the Old Testament, and together the Bible, B I B L E. And his brand new. Guys, I, look, look, look I, I really am sorry if this is coming across the wrong way. Like, this is unbelievable to me. And this, as somebody who's been serving Jesus for 30 years, a preacher for 24 years next month, um, quarter century, I don't look like it, but I got some grays on me. This is unacceptable, in my opinion, my opinion, especially for somebody who's running a large church. This is unacceptable. This is unacceptable preaching. This brand new covenant that he made with the entire human race on that, and during that last Passover. And the problem is, and what I'm getting to, is that modern Christians and mostly people who do what I do, modern pastors and writers and bloggers and authors, <laughs> people who do what I do, generation after Good generation, pastor, we've done the so. same thing. Is that what you do? Oh. These Thanks for explaining. And the reason it's been so easy to do is the way we've received our Bible. Oversimplification. When you your Bible, you were told, and understandably, I get this, this is God's word. Well, as soon as you get a book and are told it's God's word, it implies that everything in here is equal. Everything is equally applicable. So everything should be treated the same way. The, the Bible isn't God's word? Well, what is it? <laughs> It's this thing. It came together. Oh, holy moly. Wow. And that's just not true. And none of you even try to do that. We, we know intuitively we're educated people. That, wait, then when who I are you preaching against? Israel, I'm still trying to figure it out. Is not what God who are you preaching against? Jesus for us to do. It's Where are they at? It's not I'm going to go get them. Versus wrong. It's then versus now. And oh. preachers are the culprit. And you know what part of the reason is? Whoa, just, whoa. I'll talk about my industry a minute and just get some sympathy. In fact, when after oh. I say this, I would like to hear like a multi-campus. Oh. It's our fault, guys. And my son Andrew says it the best way. Some of you saw this. He says, I feel sorry for my dad. He has to do a book report every single week on the same book. Here comes Sunday, here comes Sunday, here comes Sunday. And you got to have something to say. It's like, Lord, I already said that, I already talked about that. Yeah, they know that. I know Christmas is coming. They already know that too. So I got to have some. So I, I get the pressure. I understand. But this mixing and matching of covenants, what it does is it takes Jesus' claim as king and ultimate authority and it drops him into a bucket with a whole bunch of other information and we lose the plot line. We lose. I, I don't think this guy's ever read the Bible. There's no way he could have. 
you know, I, like I saw him kind of like defending on a podcast his own, like his statements that he made about the unhinging the Old te- Testament and this and that. And like, you know, um, you know, the Old Testament, it says to, you know, it's got the, the death penalty for uh, homosexuals. <laughs> so uh, adulterers, you know, uh, that's, that's Old Testament. That's Old Testament. Well, New Testament is like. There's a reason they had those penalties back then, Bucko. Like th- there was a reason for that. Th- there was a reason for that. It-, it was to create a stable, steady culture. That's what it was for. Th- that wasn't immersed in the ungodliness and the immora- immorality and the violence and uh, all the just the, the stuff, the horrible stuff that was going on in, in the pagan world of, of their day. There's a reason for those laws, Andy. There's a reason for them. They were, it, it's, it's God's holy and perfect law. And there's this thought, I don't think, I don't think he would know this, that the Ten Commandments are just an expansion of Jesus' two commandments. Love God, love your neighbor. The Ten Commandments, they're just, they're just an expansion of that. And all of the law, you know, except for the ceremonial stuff and all that, the lamb and slay and all that, except for that, the law in the Old Testament, all the moral side of it, is all just an expansion of the Ten Commandments. It's all just an expansion. It's all accurate, good stuff. The Old Testament is desperately needed as a foundation. Do you think part of the problem in our culture today, see, I'm getting a little agitated here, could be that we're just making up our own Jesus and who we want him to be. We've become modern day Marcionites. And and that's maybe Andy Stanley. He's just just completely open about his his uh false religion, his heresy that he's practicing and preaching. False stuff about the Bible. Beware of this guy. Beware of him. You go to his church, beware. You listen to him online, beware. I honestly, I have a an academic Bible degree, like like uh, advanced degree, and this guy doesn't know anything about the Bible, like nothing. I I would not listen. Is you listen to somebody if they're biblical? You don't have to have a degree to teach the Bible. Your your authority is. God's spirit and God's word. That's your authority. Unless you're going to go and be a heretic. <laughs> then at least get a degree first. All right? That's, that's my advice. <laughs> this is why so and he needs a Bible degree. And I can, you know, kind of pick on my industry or my people. This is why so many pastors. And this Maybe straighten them out. I don't know. Nuts. This is why so many pastors talk way, 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 way more about being biblical. Oh! 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 Oh, us evil pastors talking about being biblical. Big difference. Uh, actually, Big fact, if you there's have been not. Hurt by the church, do, um, you were hurt by a church. That was there's all not. This. They had there's not they actually a difference you, at all between those two things. The they told you you couldn't come, whatever it was. Because to not be Christ-like would this. be unbiblical. To teach you people to be unchristlike. Like being this. Okay. The Bible teaches us. That. Christ liked us. They're the same. I, I, I'm, I'm not seeing. This story from the New Testament. You don't know. So when the disciples didn't go and things just became just mix and match, mix and match, mix and match, um, Jesus had to intervene. And he did two mm. big interventions. One, he recruited Saul of Tarsus. Oversimplification. And, and got him involved. That was a great, and that was a great strategy. That was huge. And he, in fact, Saul did such a good job. Strat- you know, Jesus, Paul, the, the great Paul. strategizer. Oh, that, that, that worked out. That okay. great vision casting Jesus. Jesus. came back to recruit was Peter. Oh. And here's, here's the story. It's Acts chapter He's 10. our Messiah, the, the visioneer. Story. I don't have time to tell the whole story, but it's fascinating. Acts chapter 10. Peter, okay, this is, catch this. For all you Bible nerds, this is like 15 years after the resurrection. 15 years. He's still in Judea. 15 years. In fact, he's at the beach. He's on the, at the Mediterranean Sea, hanging oh my out gosh. with everybody. Oh, Lord help and me. He what what was vision, wrong with the vision God speaks What to was him. wrong with that? These are my words, not the text words. God essentially says, what are you doing? I told you to go, and you didn't go. Now, you got to go. So tomorrow. No. 
No. Now, now this, is a, this is a blatant misrepresentation of God's word. He didn't tell him to go. God gave Peter a revelation of all the different animals saying that Gentiles could be baptized without being circumcised. That was the point. He wasn't trying to kick him out of Judea. Peter was doing a good service to the Lord there in Judea. I mean, this, this is actually like, this is terrible advice. Like, just go, just go for the, just go for the sake of going. Like, don't, you know, don't think or pray or, or think that God may have planted you somewhere for a reason. Well, somebody's coming to this house. He was staying with a friend. Somebody's coming to this house, and you're going to be invited to go about 30 miles north up the coast, and you're going to visit the end of the, you're going to go in the home of a Gentile named Cornelius. He's a wealthy centurion. I already summed it up for him, Andy. Make all of his you money, can fast honestly. forward. We're just letting you know that up front. But he's curious about the story of Jesus. And he knows bits and pieces. And he's going to fill his large house with a bunch of Gentiles. And I want you to go up there, go in his house, and I want you to put the, connect the dots for them so they understand the whole story and the whole message. And Peter's like, this is Peter. This is 15 years after the resurrection. This is walk on water, Peter. Peter's like, I'm, just, I'm not comfortable with that. Because religious tradition, I get it. I grew up oh, in one. Peter, it, he was such a Pharisee. You claws in you, and sometimes you can't see straight. You can't think straight. And Peter's like, I mean, he's like, all right. He said, sure enough, the next day, there's a knock on this guy's door. It's like, hey, Cornelius sent us down here. I want you to come up. So he makes the trip. He gets to Cornelius' house, big house. Here's you know, again, uh, who's the enemy here? Like, who, why are we telling all these stories? Like, who's the bad guy? Is there, I, I need a specific inside, person or some kind of example. Of what's, what's going <laughs> on? Who's outside. the bad guy? I'm making this part up, but I'm sure it happened. He's outside going. Pa oh, oh, pastors. Oh, pastors and Christians. He's nailed us so far. I'm We're coming. the bad ones. I just got to pray for a minute. Okay. Because in his thinking, if I go in this house, I'm ceremonially unclean. I am being untorical. I'm being unbiblical. I'm breaking God's law if I step in this house. Of course, Jesus is going, what? You peered into an empty tomb. I rose from the dead, and you won't leave home. Finally, Peter. Oversimplification. I can do this. Oh, and anyway, he goes in. Now he's so nervous. Luke mm. records how this message went, and it's so awkward. Okay, this oh, is a reminder back for some of you. Marcion loved Luke. So back in because this is he liked amazing. Luke too. There are things you think. Yeah. Oh, there are things you say. All right. Do not say everything you think, okay? Maybe that's the big application from today's message for some of you. Share that with friends. That was good, Andy. I don't know about the whole rest of this, but that was good. There are things you think, things you say, don't say. Peter gets in there. He's so nervous. He starts saying the things he's been thinking. Here's how he opens it up, okay? Surrounded by, you know, middle income, wealthy, pagan, Gentile people. He's, you know, here's what he says. You are all well aware because they live in the vicinity of Judea. They know what Jewish people are like, what they eat, what they don't eat, what they, where they go, what they won't go, who they'll do business with, who they won't do business with. You are all well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate or visit with someone basically like you guys. You know, it's, and then it gets worse. <laughs> he says, but God has shown me that mm. I should not call anyone impure or unclean. The implication is, up until yesterday, I considered all of you impure and unclean, but lucky you, God has shown me that you're not impure. This is a follower of Jesus. This is how wound up he is with Torah that God inspired through Moses. But then he put on the back burner, you got your old phone and your new phone. This is the old phone, it's a new phone. Nothing wrong with the old phone, there's just a new phone. This is the new mm. covenant. Mm. He I feel like for all the talk that he does about vision, strategy, you know, this kind of stuff, and uh, it, I could be wrong on this. I think he has a background or a degree in business or something like that. I, I feel like he's actually kind of doing a bad job at it. Um, it's almost like he's drawing upon the worst in humanity, the worst in his audience, the worst in... God's church, Jesus' church, the ones, the people for whom Jesus died. Jesus loves your church. Jesus loved them enough to die for them. You're seeing these things in them that to a certain degree, and so they go to be with Jesus, are always going to be there. What you have to do is like mobilize those people, 
those imperfect people to go out and accomplish God's mission. You know, it's like if you just point out, like, this is why you're bad and wicked and evil, you know, even like the old school preachers, you know, that get, would get the flack from a guy like this. They weren't doing that at all. Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God. You know, it's like the whole point is to demonstrate God's grace and forgiveness. Like, that's the whole point. So, like, this here, it's like all of that, Jonathan Edwards, sin in the, sinners in the hands of an angry God, Andy Stanley's <laughs> sinners in the hands of of an angry God with no good news at the end. You're just evil. You're, you're just bad. Christians are bad. Pastors are bad. You know, what am I doing? I'm preaching in a Christian church. A ah, bunch of people I don't like. There. That, this was his version of being biblical. Very biblical, very Torah-like. What if there's like a, a projection going Jesus on the with this? You know, why, why do why do people preach like this? To get are they projecting? This is about the world, not like about, about you know, Judeans are they dealing with this themselves? Right? And here's the other thing. In spite of this, and then he preaches this amazing message. Everybody in there puts their faith in Jesus because they'd heard the story. They just needed somebody to put it together. And he's the famous fisherman, Jesus' most famous follower. Whoa. He goes back to Jerusalem and reports what happened, and everybody's mad at him. They're mad at him, like, what? what are you doing going into the home? These are Jesus followers who just couldn't seem to separate the covenants. They didn't know because they didn't go. What? On, that, that's not even like a years good... Years later. You that's like a, a rap good. lyric. Church, I mean, Peter, I mean it's, it's, like not, it's not even he's a good... Charge. Like uh, years later, it's years not a good later, analogy. The church finally went all in on all in. Acts chapter 15, read the story for yourself. Acts chapter 15, there's a meeting. They finally have a, we got to figure this out meeting. And there's a group of Pharisees who are now Jesus followers, which is amazing. Why would a Pharisee begin to follow Jesus? Because they crucified him. Then they saw him. Uh-oh, no, side, right? so, some so of the Pharisees, of Pharisees didn't crucify him, genius. And they're like, no, 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 these people have Nicodemus, to. Nicodemus, you know, have to subscribe they had a to few. Before they can, you know, join us. And Peter, and now the Apostle Paul, because so many years have gone by, are saying, no, 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 no. We have seen God give his spirit to Gentiles who don't know the You know, I, I think like in his view, like people are just incredibly stupid. Like everyone's dumb like, I don't know how the church has got to this point. And, and granted, like, you know, I, it's it's not hard to think that sometimes. But but really in my heart, like, I don't think that about people. I don't think that, like, the early church was just stupid and they didn't understand, like, you know, the, the new covenant. And actually, our whole understanding of things comes from them. It comes from the way they interpreted the Old Testament. If you, if you go through, Andy, if you go through the, the, the New Testament, you'll see all these, these quotations in there. Those are quotations of what's called the Old Testament. And, and the reason that's significant is because like we should, we should look into that. You know, like why, why did they quote the Psalms like this? It seemed like David was talking about himself. Doesn't seem like he was talking about a Messiah figure. Well, what? How did? How were the apostles interpreting those psalms, and why were they interpreting them that way? And who taught them to interpret them that way? Oh, Jesus! Jesus taught them to interpret them that way. Jesus did. I mean, people. Sometimes people aren't that smart, but they're not dumb. And even the most unintellectual of them, I think, can understand a lot more than Albert Einstein about certain things. And that's the thing truth. about Torah, and they're not about to learn, and they're not going to subscribe to our dietary laws and all of our crazy laws. And I say crazy laws because in this meeting, I don't mean crazy like they weren't from God. I mean, when Gentiles thought about those laws. Well, how like, do you mean crazy, you Andy? It's, it's like. Even in this meeting, it's so amazing. 
One of the speakers. You know, the Some word guys, apologetic doesn't course. mean you have to apologize. It, it means you give Jews? a defense. We have a hard time keeping all these commandments. How in the world can we expect non-Jewish adults who weren't raised on this from childhood to suddenly wake up one day and say, okay, there's 613 of these. Let's guess the number one. I'm going to have to divorce my wife. That's not going to go well. Um, you know, so how do, right, so... So they decide, so here's, here's, here's what you mean. So James, the brother of Jesus, is actually in charge of this meeting. James, the brother of Jesus, was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. Why would James be a pastor of a Christian church? Because he saw his resurrected brother. That's why. And here's what he said at the end of the meeting. And this, this statement is on wall, on, painted on walls all over our offices. He says, okay, I've listened to both sides of the argument. I'm making a decision. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Let's remove right. every barrier we can. Let's remove the big ones, the small ones, and they did. Like who, they who's making it difficult today? I, I don't they understand. I'm, I'm still, who, who's the enemy? Barriers. They address traditional barriers, and it was so uncomfortable for them, but they did it anyway. It felt so untorical or unbiblical for them, but they did it anyway. And do you know what happened? The text tells us the church exploded in the world Whoa. of the Gentiles. Yeah. There were so many Christian people good. coming to faith in Antioch that the pagans in Antioch said, what is going on? And they came up, for a term, I came up with a term for these crazy followers of the crucified king. They called them Christians. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, he said it. He said it. Oh, we've been branded with that ever since. Which brings me finally to what actually breaks my heart and why I'm so grateful for you. Oh, Christians and pastors. The we church. already know. The, the church. church. Okay. Always gravitates. Toward Christians, it. pastors, the church. The people who know the deal, know the songs, know the verses. You got all down. Their lives are all buttoned up. Perfect. The, the focus of the church naturally gravitates toward insiders rather than people who are outside the faith. This is just the natural gravitational pull of the church. So, uh, no kidding. almost 29 years ago, we were part of a movement to reverse that and to change that. And for years, huge progress was made. Brand new churches popped up all over the place that were organized around being outsider focused, community focused. Let's love people well. Let's serve the community well. And when they ask why, it's because we follow Jesus and we're just... You, you, can't, you can't try to do the work of the church today, in today's culture, a, uh, an, an incredibly politically divided culture today, culturally divided, ideologically divided. It is, Andy, it is, I'm sorry, you're living in a world that existed 20 years ago. And I'm going to be completely honest with you here. The reason things are the way they are today is because the church and its strategy 20 years ago wasn't a good one. What we did was we pacified and we allowed and we said, sure, here, you know, come in atheists. We're, we're all about you. And, you know, and, and, and now go figure the atheists are running our government and, and the, athe the atheists and are running our school board. And, and we got, you know, um, a story hour with the little kids with, you know, books being read by somebody who looks like a demon. I, I mean, it's, it's because of, the reason things look like they look today is because of that exact strategy that you were using 20 years ago. Now, what is the strategy that we need to use today? I think we're still trying to figure that out. We need to reach people with God's love, but we can't do it in the same way that we were doing it back then. We, we can't, today you can't just say, we're going to love people well and... Because the problem is too many people think today by love people well, that you're never going to offend anybody. And, and that's not at all love. That's, that's actually a very, that's actually, a, that's like saying, I hate you. If, if you, if you don't really truly proclaim the gospel and call somebody out on their sin, whether it's a public figure, whether it's somebody that, you know, a family member, if you're basically biblically, you're saying, I hate you, <laughs> but like you, you ever hear the, there's a, one of the uh, Proverbs in the book of Proverbs, old, old Testament book. I know Andy wouldn't like it, but it's this thing about, it says how 
uh, you know, faithful are the wounds of a friend. In other words, like when a friend rebukes you, it's actually a very good thing. It's, it saves your, it can save your life literally, but an enemy through their flattery, it's, it's like them taking a knife and, and just stabbing you in the back, you know? So like, so, so ministry from 20 years ago, is not going to work today. I, I would make an argument that, it, quite frankly, it didn't work then. I mean, it might have puffed up our churches a little bit, but it did nothing to fulfill those verses that you opened with in terms of uh, discipling the nations. And, and, and let's just start with this nation. <laughs> let's, start, let's start with this nation. Let's disciple this nation, okay? The policies that we had as church folk 20 years ago did nothing, very little, to disciple the nation. It actually created a lot of the problems we have today. So I, it very Bobby misguided Lord, what Jesus he's saying here. Us. Very misguided. I expect church. better from no somebody who should know more, who's, whose dad no more. was and Charles come, Lord Stanley. Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, and rescue us and rapture us out of this horrible cesspit so you can condemn all, you know, it's just not even, that's definitely not biblical or jesus cool. okay? That's, we can talk about that some other time. You'll, you'll see at the end of the message. Please don't. But anyway, so churches organized around reaching, not keeping, and the good news became good again. And for all people began to mean all again. But when churches like ours began to grow quickly, in fact, that was one of the criticisms for five or six years in those early years when we were just getting started. I heard it over and over and over from pastors and from Christians. Well, it's so big, they must be doing something wrong. This was the argument. It's so successful. There's so many people. They can't hey, possibly I, I'm not saying be that. preaching the true I mean, there's a lot of wonderful, I bet they never faithful megachurch pastors right? out there. They, they, it's too big. I'm like, have you read the book of Acts? 3,000 people came to faith in one day in Acts. Anyway, so this is a criticism. So then what happened? What do you think happened? Well, when a bunch of churches like ours begin to grow quickly, everybody's like, hmm, we want to grow quickly. So all the hens ran to the other side of the hen house. It's like, we want to do this too. And suddenly casual was cool and bands are in and choirs are out and handbells are like way out, you know, except for <laughs> traditional. Then do you remember this? You don't see this much anymore. For, for years and years and years, you'd drive by a church, contemporary service, you know, nine o'clock because, you know, we got to give the, the older people their 11 o'clock service, traditional service. Everybody's going to do both of these. Well, what were they doing? I, I wonder if he just... Just needs a sabbatical this, this or something. Like maybe that, I don't know. It might give him some perspective. I, I feel like he's kind of so lost his mind a little bit here. And there were thousands and thousands and thousands of churches. Now, everywhere you go, every church kind of looks the same. There's no more steeples. The buildings are different. Everybody dresses. Meaning. Animals, right? And they, the modern church, the modern church vibe there we go. they got. The feel, look and feel, and cool and casual. But I'm telling you, because I'm this is, this is what I do. They miss the heart and the passion of this movement. Because our goal and the goal of these, the people who came before me even and before us, their goal wasn't growth, it was reach. We set out, the reason we made the changes we did wasn't to be that cool. That makes we no sense. That all the time. You're just trying to be cool. I won't look at them and go, well, it doesn't take much. Anyway, sorry. Um, <laughs> oh, oh, I mean, do, do you, I wonder if, does Andy think he's cool? I, <laughs> Wow. <laughs> oh, man. Maybe hit the gym a little bit first, buddy. Oh. <laughs> we set out, you know why we did this? We set out to remove obstacles. We set out to invite people to follow Jesus. And that's what, uh, what, is the, what is the difference? The difference between growth and reach. Growth and reach. Reach causes growth. The Great Commission teaches growth. Why wouldn't we want growth? You want growth. Healthy things grow. Good things grow. The, the kingdom of God grows. It's like the you know, little mustard seed that took over the whole shop. That, that's what happens. I, I just feel like this is a little bit of a uh, nonsensical uh, statement here. And it, began, and it began so pure and it began so Amazing, and, and many of you were here from from I, Bob Bryant sitting right back here. Yeah, and so we got a bunch of evil pastors and Christians and, and church people involved in it. And then it, his office because we had nothing. And it all got idea. terrible. But we grew up in church, and we don't want to be church for church people. We done that. We saw where that led. It makes people cynical and critical. 
and they turn their backs to community and everybody doesn't agree with them. They're just wrong. And they're going, I just feel like he's acting like everyone who doesn't have this incredible strategy of appeasement is like, uh, being a negative standoffish church or church person. I, I just feel like it's like, it's like, it's this like sort of like false dichotomy. Like there's, there's no shades of middle and clearly he would be on one of the far, far ends. Um, uh, but it's like there's most churches that I know, like the overwhelming majority of the pastors that I know, and I know a lot of pastors in my community, they're all wonderful, welcoming people, and their people really love the Lord. They are not perfect, but they really love the Lord. They are welcoming. They're they're not like you and doing some of the stuff you're talking about there, because I, I don't see... Quite frankly, I don't, I don't see how what you're saying about the people that you're preaching to is edifying. Your job as a preacher is to edify the body, to build it up. That's, that's your job. I mean, so... If you get saved, come on in, but something to we think can't about. have anything to do with you. Like Peter going, I know I need to go in there. I know I need to go in there, but I just can't go in there. There it is all over again. So unfortunately, this is why I'm talking about this. Unfortunately, much of that progress that you were a part of creating in other churches, not just us, much of that progress is being undermined and reversed like crazy right now. With all the political nonsense in the last few years, it has picked up speed like crazy. Oh boy, Uh uh-oh, we're going political now. People feeling it are conservative. And I'm so so theologically conservative. I'm even politically conservative. You're you're not theologically conservative, believe me. By conservative, fearful fundamentalists, don't have time to define that, academics and pastors and churches. Ch- church leaders are resurrecting old barriers. I wouldn't have thought he was politically conservative. Now, My goodness. And they're adding new barriers. Now I'll give you a quick example. I texted him this morning, told him I was going to talk about him in oh. church. Um, one of the two Uh-oh. people who really launched this movement way back in the late 70s is Rick Warren. Huh. The Purpose Driven Life. Before he wrote The Purpose Driven Life, he wrote The Purpose Driven Church. That book sold millions of copies to pastors, and it was a book about well, how it was, to create a church. Uh, I think that book was actually the mid-90s. People. It wasn't the I mean, 70s. He, he inspired so many of us, right, to, 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 get, to help get the church back on mission. He is a modern church reformer. There's no way about, around it. Last year, some of you know about this. I don't, I don't know that I've ever heard him denomination preach the things him out of the you're preaching, though. I, for something immoral, no. Something illegal, no. Something that had to do with money, no. Because he's had some addiction, no. None of that, you know, glamorous stuff, right? They kicked him out because he had the nerve to ordain three female staff members who were functioning as pastors. He ordained them as pastors, which is actually a They wanted to be biblical. <gasps> gave them a tax benefit. They're doing the work of all the other male pastors. He's like, well, why in the world would we not make them pastors? They're pastoring. And they weren't going to go out and lead a church. They were working on his staff. He ordained three women, and they kicked him out <clears throat> of the church. Is it, I would think here, the way he's talking, he needs to bring in a big name. Because um, I wouldn't think the things that he's saying, in my opinion, I mean, they don't resonate with me at all. Like, and I, and I've been serving Jesus for, you know, 30 years. They don't resonate with me at all. They don't inspire me. They don't, um, like, the, the Bible inspires me. Uh, the, the early Christians inspire me. Many of the pastors that I know in my community inspire me. They have tremendous ministries that are making <clears throat> an incredible difference. But I just wonder... I wonder again, I know I keep saying this, but like, like, who is he really speaking to? And uh, what, what is he actually trying to accomplish? You don't get any more insider focused than that. And there's hmm. example after example after example after example after example. Any more, any more leaders, and I consider myself insider focused. Not evangelistic, that. that's different any more. and evangelistic, but evangelical. Like that's the, the epitome. leaders are prioritizing politics like anger over mission. embodied is and murder. The that's the, churches are or maybe a serial killer. Hook, line, and sinker, and globbing on all their political views. And the most insider focused you can possibly views. be is. Am I right? Okay, just want to let you know right up thinking front, that, okay? You women are, shouldn't right? be we ordained. That. You wouldn't have a view if you didn't think it was the right thing to do, right? But they have That's the most insider focused anyone can ever be. They've done. They've taken That's it. Old you heard it. Testament or old covenant terminology, old covenant stories. Now that bad old covenant with their politics and glob it on to the message and the person of Jesus and it's just 
sick and they're, they're, they're prioritizing politics over mission. Whoa, whoa, wow. Oh, again, again, like who's the, who is this message directed towards? Who is he truly inspiring to go out and make a difference? Who? Like, like who would honestly be inspired with this? That's why he's basically preaching a sermon and, and please take note of what I'm saying. He's preaching a sermon that's not really making a headway with people. So he pulls a big name in and talks about this incredible cultural evil that was done to him. It's not that this, this incredible cultural evil that was done to Rick Warren via the SBC last year. Well, now, whatever negative feelings you have about what they did to him, then I want you to, I want, I want to channel that. I want you to focus that on what I'm saying and on me and on my sermon. It, it doesn't. Pulling in a big name in a situation, it won't rescue a bad sermon. Does that make any sense? Like, just just because this idea or this thing, good or bad, whatever it is, because there's there's truly good Christians that fall on both sides of that aisle that the SBC went through last year. But it does. It's not going to rescue your sermon. Like you either have a good idea or you have a bad idea. I think just in general, this message. This is just one sermon. This is basically the message that he preaches every week because there's clips that surface of him, like you know, every so often, and it's just, you know, the next one's worse than the last. No affiliation. So. I, I don't know who you follow on social media. I try to follow everybody, so I, you know what the know what the conversation no, is. Oh, clearly, I know. Famous people try to appeal to everyone. Religious world. How's that Political going for you? You just lost me. Test. For orthodoxy, I hope you haven't seen this, but let me just tell you, what I'm about to tell you is not kind of off in a corner. This is mainline speaking and posting and books are written and chapters and books are written about this. Right now, the current thing for the last three or four years is that you can't, I was gonna put this on the screen, but um, there are things I Bro. should never put on a screen and have a picture taken because- it's Get anyway, to your so. point. You know what the messaging is now? This isn't in the corner. These are, if I name the people who are saying these things, you've heard of most of them. You've read some of their books. That you can't be a Christian and be a Democrat. You can't be, you can't possibly be a true Christian if you're a Democrat. I I mean, this is again, like, here's the thing is, you know, I've I've been a preacher for 24 years and I, I went through a phase, you know, about it was during the 2016 election when there was a lot of division back then. And I remember um, there were there was it was the first time that I, uh, oh, my gosh, I almost unfollowed someone on Facebook. And I remember how how like traumatic it was for me. And, um, you know, back then, like it was different than it is today. T- today, it's the culture has has it has digressed. 10 times what it was even 10 years ago. And some of these issues, you know, while, while I wouldn't, I wouldn't go quite that far to publicly say that, that you can't be a Democrat and be a Christian. I would seriously challenge the, uh, as a Christian, the, the, uh, the party line that promotes and endorses abortion the legalization of infanticide, the, mutil- the mutilation of young children. Like, like, really stop and think about some of these things. It really shows you, there, by no stretch is, is the right perfect um, at all. I mean, you know, there's, I, I was incredibly offended. I watched the, the Republican convention, and they, there was a Hindu prayer in the middle of it. And I'm like, what on earth? What is this? Like, we're, we're, pray- we're praying to pagan gods now, apparently. Um. But I think when you talk about a, a party strategy and some of the things that you see going on in culture today, I, I think it, it's becoming harder and harder to um, justify the statement that he just made. And, and, it, and so I think you just really, this is, this is really his preachers. I, I would not do what he's doing. What he's doing right now is not going to help heal this culture. All it does is uh, it, it smashes the problem down. It smashes the people down. Um, and, and it doesn't really bring about a healthy resolution to some of these more complex issues that we're dealing with. I mean, basically, the strategy is, is this. Like, like, just don't talk about it. Just don't say it. Just, just don't mention that, that babies are getting murdered. Just don't mention it. Like it's, it's no big deal. You know, I mean, 
which is absolutely absurd. But what's even more absurd is as conservative. It's really Christians not that absurd, Andy. I, it's really not. A lot, Democrats, a lot of people feel that way. And you can't a lot of Christians and, and, and pastors they basically go against feel that one way. Of Jesus' primary teachings. Instead of loving their enemies, the, all these lost Democrats. Well, do not murder is a pretty important teaching. They make, they make Democrats the enemy. That's kind of a love and your neighbor Jesus thing. What tell us to do with our enemies? Anybody remember? Don't yeah. murder them. So let me just say to those of you who are conservative politically like me, if you do that, stop it. You can disagree, <laughs> but you don't write somebody off as bad and evil. I just That's totally saw that Michael thing. Jordan meme in my head. Oh, you my gosh. <laughs> All that has to happen in any country stop it. is for the majority. <laughs> Look it up. You'll see what I'm talking about. Evil. Michael Jordan meme, stop evil, it. They're cockroaches and they're rats. And once they're evil, the only thing to do with evil, you don't but, redeem evil. You don't, uh, you know, you don't what share else your is faith it? with evil. You get rid of evil. That language. I, I mean, isn't, mm, isn't that what God's going to do one day? The reason we preach against these, the reason we preach against gross, negligent evil in our culture, Andy, as preachers, is because we don't want those people to face God's judgment. That's the reason we do it. We're trying literally to save our culture. I'm actually questioning your motives at this point. Like, are we actually trying to do the same things? What are you trying to accomplish? And what are preachers like you? Because there's others out there. What are they trying to accomplish it seems to me that you're actually working against the kingdom. It seems to me that you're actually shuffling people in to hell. So Which just think is about so that. so extraordinarily harmful. And this is one of many but reasons why You, you summed said, it up. You're very harmful. Somebody considers very. you an enemy. Don't you dare return the favor. Do you demonize people that you've been called to reach? And this group of people, like these are some of them are, are my friends. They have turned the mission field into a battlefield. And they're warriors. Yes. Yes. The, the church, you ever hear the expression, it's the church militant? That's what we are. We are Jesus army. Yes, we're apologists and we're evangelists and we're uh, pastors and teachers and everyday Christians, you know, but we're an army. We're God's army that's going out in the world and we face spiritual battles. Like the, the, the battle is real. It's real. To pretend that there's not a battle, a spiritual war, you've got to be totally oblivious to what's going on around you. I mean, I mean, you can't honestly be engaging or addressing any, any, any cultural issue. And if, if you go back through the history of the Christian church, Christians have always engaged cultural issues. Always. All the way back to the very beginning days of our faith. But All the way back to the beginning. The kingdom of Christ. And here's how you know. This is the litmus test. If you haven't been paying attention, don't miss this. No, I'm paying attention. If you need an enemy, mm. if you need an enemy in order to further your agenda, rest assured, it is not the agenda of our king, period. Like, These like leaders, who needs leaders, an enemy? Leaders. I think they just right? have a big following because people... The, the, the assumption here is that Christians... Like today, like just your average Christian is going around out there like, you know, where's my enemy? Oh, oh, man, that last guy I got in a fight with, he moved out of town. I don't see him anymore. You know, he left my church. I need a new enemy. I need a new enemy. Like, th like that doesn't exemplify any church person that I know. I mean, there's, there's a couple people that over the years, you know, a couple, a couple most church people I know, they've been changed. They've been bought by the blood of Jesus. They want to make the world a better place. They're, they're actually looking to make the world a better place. So you don't need to chastise them like this. But these leaders, do you know what they it's kind rally of dysfunctional. Around? They don't rally around so much what they believe in common 
and they would totally disagree with what I'm about to say. They've rallied around who they hate. It's safe to say I'm probably going to disagree with whatever you're about to say. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You treat them like they're less than people. You have demonized them. You have written them off. That's what hate is. They rally around who they hate in common, but more importantly, they rally around what they fear in common. Oh. Jesus' most oft-repeated command. Oh. Fear not. Whoa, oh, oh. Oh, my mic wasn't attached right now. I drop it. This group, again, some of my friends. I still consider them friends. They say terrible things about me on social media. I just text them and call them and say, hey, I saw your post. You want to talk? That's <laughs> what I do. I mean, the people close to me, they know. I, look, I, I get cell phone numbers. I just text them and call them and say, hey, it's Andy. I know you think I'm just a little picture on something. I, I'm a real person. I want to talk. Uh, I mean, I really... I Andy, would I loved your love daddy. to talk. I loved, I loved, I love to. <laughs> I, please. I mean, you felt fine getting up and just, you know. Look me up on social media, at Pastor AJ Platt. Send me a I'm message. I'd, I'd love to, I I'd love to talk. So what, we're supposed to teach what Jesus taught. This is what he, this is what he taught. You know what's happened? They've become like the priest and the Levite in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Remember the Good Samaritan? The priest comes by, sees the guy laying there, walks by. Samaritan sees the guy laying there and walks by. The, the text says that when they saw him, the priest who saw the man, he passed by on the other side. You know why the guy passed by, the priest and the Levite passed by on this other side? Very yeah, To tell us, people. Mr. Morrill. Because their scripture, their text, their Bible forbade them from touching anything dead. Or mostly dead. Mm. They had a verse. They had an excuse. They did not have the heart of their king. And it's why Jesus told the parable and made the Samaritan the hero because they hated Samaritans. And Jesus is saying, look, in my kingdom, in my new world, in the age that is to come, that's not how it works anymore. Whoa. They, yeah. they were like, the, they were like in, in the parable, they passed right by the person who was in need, even though Eventually, they would discover that their Savior did not walk past them when they were in need. He didn't walk past me when I was dead in my transgressions, in my sin, to use Bible terms. He didn't walk by you when you were dead and separated from God in your transgressions and your We still sin. haven't really clarified How the enemy of walk by anyone and the sermon that you're... So them who them who are you preaching at? An uh, not to have to have and what are they supposed to do? Not walk to do by somebody that's dead. Not... I don't know that we've really gotten one practical example in this again, sermon of... The church, could, especially you kind of got to do that, you know. Churches in America. Once again, the church is known more for what and who we're against than what and who we're for. But... Meaning, not you, example, and not here, and that's why I absolutely love. See, this is this is actually this is, this rhetorical style is just so terrible. I mean, it, it's you see people do this all the time, and it's like, oh, all of this bad. Oh, people do this. See, there was a there was a, a joke like when I first went into ministry. People are saying, you know, th- you know, the person that will come up to you and say. If you're in leadership of any kind, people are saying, really, it's them. It's like that person that's going around doing it, but, you know, it gets them off the hook. Well, who are the people? Well, people, people are saying, it's like, it's like you're creating this enemy. There's no specific examples. There's no like path forward for how to change. It's a very terrible rhetorical style. I mean, honestly, like, Gosh, I'm even thinking like, you know, even if you look at like some of the hyper extremists like liberals in our our culture, you know, like they at least have like some kind of like tangible, um, you know, Republicans just like rich people. They've, it, so they've got a <laughs> that's that's like their thing. And then it's like, don't don't vote Republican. At least there's like some, you know, uh uh, hate Christians. That's like another thing today. You know, hate, hate Christians. Like they're, they're bad. Like, like there's no, I, I still don't really understand who are we hating? We know that the Pharisees were bad, right? But like, who are they today? I, I don't understand. Like, like what did, was there a greeter in the church that like, wouldn't let somebody in because they had like blue hair, you know, was, was there like that, 
And by the way, like, I, this is just, it's just devil's advocate. When does this really ever happen in our churches today? Even in conservative churches. To, conservative churches by today's standards aren't conservative at all. Like, at all, compared to 30 years ago, 40 years. They're not, like, it's, it's a joke. It's a joke. Do people still deal with some of the things that he's talking about here? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, but but you know, again, my point is like like give us some examples and it might help. Power. That's Churches. my point. And it's why I love our leadership and it's why I love our volunteers and it's why I'm so grateful for our elders and I'm so grateful for our staff and it's why I love serving <laughs> with you because together <laughs> we have Where is this coming from? We're going to continue to resist that trend because we believe and operate under this banner hmm. that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. He didn't call himself a king for nothing and he's not been declared a king for nothing. He's the king. He's the ultimate authority. And consequently, wow, we are committed. A, We're committed to teaching people to obey everything he's commanded us. And we are committed to obeying everything he's commanded us. I think he's landing we a plane won't here. always get it right. And I won't always get it right. But when we get it wrong, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do what he commanded us. We're going to own our sin and we're going to own our faults and our failures because that's what he told us to do. And when we mess up with people, we're gonna make things right with people regardless of what percentage of the problem was our problem. Because he took uh, all We still don't have one example of what he's talking about. What and problem? He did that, he Who? Took all our Single mom? Away. Church elder? What's, what's the problem? Which means practically speaking. Oh. We are empowered. We can oh. disagree culturally and politically and love unconditionally. And we love can do that un- oh because that's gosh. exactly what Jesus did. Listen, when Jesus showed up on planet uh, Earth, nobody lined up with him on anything. They didn't see God the same way, sin the same way. They didn't see women the same way. I, I mean, he, he did, right, in a sense. But I just think the idea of unconditional love and the way it's preached today seem to be completely unbiblical. Like, as though God doesn't care when you violate his laws and your fellow man like as though he doesn't care and and what is at that point what is love like is is love is is it just a feeling like are we are we just saying like well god still feels feelings for me because like there's an element of god's love that absolutely is conditional if if you don't uh if you violate the the covenant the terms of the covenant that he's made with you you will face his wrath you'll face his wrath you know so is is love uh, this is this really needs unpacked a bit this is a really sweeping statement here that needs unpacked they didn't see religion the same way the the church needs to really think about this because i hear this rhetoric all the time you know what he did He loved them, he served them, he carried their burden. So here's what I think. I Mm. think from Decatur, I can care. I want to know what God thinks. All over the state now and all over the country and more and more all over the world. Our increasing political and racial diversity is a struggle. Oh, solve it for us, please. We are an imperfect picture. We are an imperfect picture of a perfect age to come. We are a commercial announcement for a coming attraction. We are a commercial announcement for the kingdom of God that will eventually come to earth. John, who gave us the book of Revelation, which has confused people ever since he wrote it. It doesn't so confuse me at all. I, I wrote a book on it. Points of light in the book of Revelation. End Times Mission. Buy it on Amazon. <laughs> and I'll close with this. It won't confuse you when you're he done says, either. I saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, and I heard a loud voice from the throne, which is Jesus. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he's going to dwell with them. And they will be his people. All the people will be his people. And God himself will be with them. And he's going to be their God. And get this promise. This is why we are the hope of the world as what a church. On and he earth says, and when this God have to comes do with Jesus anything establishes his kingdom, he talked about in his sermon. Every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying. You know, this, this is why a lot of people gravitate away from what's called topical sermons and, and topical sermons aren't bad if they're, if they're done well. I mean, I know a lot of pastors that preach topical sermons every week, but it, it's, it's why expository sermons are helpful 
if you have a starting place from the text and you spend your time there really unpacking it for people, you know, it helps them to understand a little bit more. And then you're not sort of left at the end where you should be kind of putting a bow tie on things and driving your point home a little bit more and inviting people to take their application steps. Like you wouldn't be just sort of launching into this random scripture, this random idea about the future the, the and order of things the new Jerusalem from away. Revelation. He, I mean, this is amazing. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Uh -huh. We don't make it new. We make it better in the meantime. Through our lives oh. and our love and our generosity. Well, our we're so bad though, Andy. I mean, we can't. We're just and Christians and pastors. We're the to bad guys. Despise or demonize those God loves. And who does God love? He loves the Republicans. <laughs> and the Democrats. He he must have a lot of Republicans in his church. Right? I mean, is that, and, and this is what he's preaching to these people. Really? Like, I'm blown away by he this. He loves brown, black, and white. We no. are all precious in no, his sight. Quoting nursery we rhymes. must be precious in each other sight as well. And shame on a person who names the name of Jesus that does anything less than that. I'll admit, the current trend toward fundamentalism, nationalism, what's in for me-ism, you know, when it all oh, comes. Oh, 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 throwing all kinds. Of, <laughs> he's throwing every, every single bad. He's just kind of, this is a kind of catch-all. This was the garbage disposal sermon. That's now, I get it now. I see all these things that he didn't like out there. You know, them Christian nationalists, us evil Christian nationalists, evil people, you know, Christian nationalists, that, like all this. He's just ranting against all these things that, you know, a lot of them aren't necessarily bad. Like things need to be held in balance. But I mean, certainly... There's been a, and this is something, it's almost worthy of a whole separate video, but, uh, you know, extremist, far leftist liberals today have like coined this term Christian nationalist, like in the Christian nationalist didn't even coin the term. But the reason they coined the term is because there's a lot of Christians pushing, a back, pushing back against cultural evils in our time. And so what they've tried to do is they're, they're trying to make that a bad thing. But, you know, if, if you think about it, like, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of all for more Christianity in our government and more Christianity in our school systems. I'm, I'm kind of all for that. I mean, we've, we've tried the secular way. And it, it, I don't even like what secularism has done to the church. It's really made a, such a pathetic church out of us all like that, like— I mean, like, let's, let's be church like the New Testament was church. Let's do that, and let's, let's preach better sermons. The trends, they're discouraging. But at the end of the day, I'm not discouraged. I'm grateful. I, you've discouraged I'm, me. I mean, who would be I'm encouraged by you. this? And I'm hopeful. Yeah, this was your title, of what right? Grateful and hopeful. Our generation. Here's the promise. Here's the promise by the resurrected Savior and King. He All said, right. I will, regardless of what happens. I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The church wins, and when the church wins, everybody wins. There are no losers. It is the oh. nature of the kingdom oh. of God. And he says, and if you'll participate, you hear that, friends? participate with me. We sure. all get participation trophies, Always everybody. The of the age. So thank you. Oh, Let's keep well, going. it's good that he finished with us online from all the Great the Commission. Support us with your prayers and even your financial gifts. Thank you as well. We could not do all of this without. <laughs> That's like almost like he he has to say these things now because he's beat people up so bad. I mean, he even bludgeoned them. I mean, like not not even in a. You know when you hear good preaching. And you're like, and you hear people out there say like, I, I want the pastor to hit me right between the eyes. You ever say that or hear somebody say that? Like you want the word of God to be preached in a way that it cuts you, but you don't want to, there's another saying, you don't cut your nose off to spite your face. Or if you cut their nose off with your preaching, they can't smell the roses. So like, 
I kind of feel like that's what he's doing a little bit here. It's, it, it, it's like at this point you have to say, hey, I'm actually, guys, I'm actually thankful for the volunteers. I'm actually thankful for the people who pay my salary. I'm thankful. I wanted to compliment you just in the last minute of the sermon because I spent the last hour talking about how bad and, and vile you really are. I'm not. I'm, I'm not. You are. I'm, I mean, that, that really sounds more like the Pharisees to me, to be honest. I mean, it, would, it, it might have been helpful if there was an example from his personal life, maybe. I mean, pre- preachers, this is, a great, this is a great point here. Listen, it's great, especially when you're, you know, going in hard at the congregation on something. Like, bring up a personal example about how God worked in your own life. Then you don't sound like the Pharisees you're criticizing. Of you. Heavenly Father. Help us to get it right. And when we don't, help us to recognize we didn't get it right. Raise up church leaders, raise up Christians who are loyal to their king first and their country second. And we know we'll have a better country. So give us wisdom to know what to do with what we just heard. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, there you go, guys. Uh, I just thought I'd have some fun this week and actually look at a... In an All right, well, there you go, guys. Uh, what are your thoughts on things? Uh, you know, or do you think Andy Stanley is worthy of the name... Heretic. That was really the idea that we began with. Uh, I felt like it uh, would be fun to go through an entire sermon, uh, maybe to kind of look at some of the ideas that are presented there, some of the things that we do wrong as preachers sometimes, uh, but also the dangers that there are when we start to preach heretical ideas. And, uh, you know, uh, you can go back and look at some of the other things he said by just Googling them uh, previously, previous statements he's made, you know, either affirming statements or stuff that he said about unhinging the Old Testament. I think I've even done previous videos on those. But, um, you know, what do you think here? I think there was certainly some concerning elements, especially when he made his statement about not being biblical and, uh, you know, saying that Jesus is the authority, but the Bible's not. There's there's some incredibly concerning things there. I think as a preacher, he seems to show an incredible lack of awareness of just general theology, the Bible itself, what it is. Uh, I think that's especially dangerous for somebody who's shepherding a large group of people. I mean, in theory, it's dangerous for anybody who's shepherding anyone. But this is definitely stuff that we got to think about. And uh, um, I'm going to actually just say, I'm going to stick with the title of my thumbnail and I'm going to say that this guy is really on the edge of uh, really being a heretic. I, I think he's actually, you know, technically I'd say he crossed the line. So I'll answer the question. I'll give you my thoughts on it. Um, I think the things that he's teaching are uh, not only are they unbiblical, which is a fine term, by the way, and, uh, but they're, they're also incredibly dangerous. They're incredibly hateful to God um, and to God's people. And, uh, you know, my, my prayer is that if you're a pastor out there and, you know, you, you look to guys like this, um, I, I just really want to encourage you to find another strategy, find another style, find another example, find somebody who's a preacher that's not afraid to preach God's word at people. Um, that's, that's try, try not to, uh, please don't apologize for the Bible, like every step of the way, especially when you're giving a sermon to the church. God's not apologizing for himself. You don't need to apologize for him. You don't need to apologize for weird Christians. You just got to be yourself, and you got to preach Jesus. That's what you got to do. And I think uh, when you do that, you'll be surprised at the results. You'll be surprised at how your life will bear incredible fruit for God. You'll be surprised at uh, how you'll fulfill the Great Commission. You'll be surprised 
at how people will want to know the Jesus that you know when you're honest with them and you just live your faith, even if it's weird to the outside world. It isn't weird to God. And it's really not weird at all because what is weird? I would say weird is anything that Jesus isn't doing. Weird is anything that the people of God aren't doing. And that's the reason we invite people into our churches. We do that because we don't want them to be on the wrong side of eternity. That's incredibly loving, and uh, that's what we're all about. That's what uh, Pastor AJ here is all about. That's what Gospel Ministries is all about. I love you, friends. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please leave a comment. I'd like to see what your thoughts are on this. And uh, if you want to answer the question for me, is Andy Stanley a heretic? Friends, you come to your own conclusion on that, but I will see you in the next video. Hey guys, Pastor AJ here, and thanks for visiting my channel. If you don't mind, I'm going to take just a sec to tell you about Gospel Ministries and our mission to help others experience, demonstrate, and share God's great gospel. If you want, you can pick up some of our merch in our YouTube store to help you communicate that same gospel message. And I'd love it if you would consider subscribing to this channel so that we can challenge your Christian walk through solid biblical teaching as it applies to culture and other issues. In addition to that, you can go to PastorAJ.com where you can consider partnering with this ministry and to sign up for my weekly email newsletter. Don't forget, I'm on all other social media platforms at Pastor AJ Platt. One other item that might interest you has to do with a topic that I've studied pretty extensively. It's my book, End Times Mission, that will give you a solid education on the different views of eschatology and, more importantly, your role in Jesus' kingdom while we wait for his return. This book covers the historical origins of popular end times teachings as it guides the reader to Christ's current reign in a post-millennial worldview. Oh, and one last thing. I want you to know that you know Jesus. So if you'd like to, leave a comment or send me a message so that I can help you do just that because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes.